Uh, welcome back to the City Talks. I'm Jordan Sanger Ross in the History Department at UVic. Uh, and I'm excited tonight to introduce our speaker, Sean Mills, who's recently accepted a position uh, as a history professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, Sean Mills will talk tonight, as many of you will know, on uh, city, nation, and empire, the urban texture of Montreal's 1960s. So tonight, Sean Mills. Uh, Sean Mills is the recipient of what I think is very well-deserved early career accolades and success. Uh, he began in January at the University of Toronto after holding two prestigious postdocs at two world-class departments at great institutions, first in history at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then at NYU, uh, postdoc that he just completed in the English department in two very different urban environments, certainly. Uh, before that, he received his PhD at Queen's in 2007, a PhD that received several prestigious awards both at his university and from professional associations. That dissertation became a book that is the basis for the talk, or part of it is the basis for the talk tonight. Uh, the book is titled The Empire Within, Post-Colonial Thought and Political Activism in Sixties Montreal which has already been awarded the Quebec Writers' Federation First Book Award, and I think is likely to garner more praise and attention in the next year or two. He's also editor of a separate volume, New World Coming, The Sixties and the Shaping of Global Consciousness, which came out in 2009. I think Sean's a terrific addition to the series. I'm a historian, and Sean's a historian, so I'm excited to have him here. Um, but I think he'll perform an important task for us tonight. I'm going to set him up if he's to perform an important task. Um, so I think we know, I think people coming to these events think that cities are important. Uh, particularly in 20th century Canada, as more and more people lived in cities. And yet there's been some difficulty in urban history, I think, to connect cities to other large narratives that Canadians tell about Canadian history. Uh, narratives of political movements and organization and political radicalism, discussions of transnational networks of ideas and communication, shifts in individual and group identity over time, big historical narratives that we know have some connection to cities. Many people organizing politically are in cities. Many people engaging in transnational discussions have been residing in cities, and group and individual identities have been transformed in cities. And yet, establishing how a city matters to those other historical processes, how it matters that these people have been located in the city, how urban environments shape and are interwoven with these other historical processes has been a challenge. And I think you'll find tonight that uh, Professor Mills provides exemplary answers uh, to these kinds of questions. So his talk again tonight is City, Nation, and Empire, the Urban Texture of Montreal in the 1960s. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say it's uh, just an incredible pleasure uh, to be here today. It's wonderful being in Victoria. I want to start off by thanking Jordan for the wonderful invitation. It's my first time in uh, Victoria, and through some fate of chance, I'm staying uh, at a hotel near the intersection of Quebec and Montreal Street. Uh, <laughs> so it's a perfect uh, location for, for tonight's talk. I think with everything uh, that's been happening in the Middle East over the past uh, couple of weeks, we're really reminded of the importance of cities uh, as sites of symbolic power, as well as sites of symbolic resistance. It should not be very surprising, uh, controversial, or by any means out of the ordinary, to state that one of the most momentous events of global history of the second half of the 20th century was the incredible, in retrospect, rather swift, decolonization of what French intellectual Alfred Sauvy had termed in 1952 the Third World. Through a complicated and interrelated series of events, roughly 100 new states emerged, and a new wave of political opposition also spread across Latin America. As a result of the complicated and multifaceted decolonization of Africa and Asia, historian Frederick Cooper maintains, the aura of normality attached to empire for millennia began to give way. Now, the breakup of European empires in a relatively short period of time following the Second World War did not happen on its own 
course. It was a product of, at times, a long and protracted and courageous political struggle. It came about as a result of the commitment of individuals and social groups. It was at times violent, and it was at times nonviolent. It was both orchestrated in the political sphere, and it was often demanded from the streets below. But no one can deny the incredible power of the mobilization of citizens and groups to bring about such widespread political change, as limited as the victories may now appear at times in retrospect. Now, collective social movements, as historian Robin Kelly reminds us, are incubators of new knowledge. Collective social movements actually create new knowledge. And new ideas often emerge out of a concrete intellectual engagement with the problems of aggrieved populations confronting systems of oppression, this is quoting Kelly. And this was certainly the case with the global anti-colonial and anti-imperialist movements following the Second World War. Out of the concrete struggles emerged a whole new body of theory, new ways of conceptualizing the world, new ways of conceptualizing political action, and new ways of conceptualizing democracy. <coughs> by the 1960s, in a context shaped by global decolonization, as well as by the polarizing forces of the Cold War, Western intellectuals were forced to recognize what Christian Ross has called one of the great gauchist particularities of the times. Theory itself, she argues, was being generated not from Europe, but from the Third World. And no North American city was as dramatically affected by third world liberation theory as Montreal. No North American city was as dramatically affected by third world liberation theory as Montreal. Yet, despite the profound and undeniable influence of this third world liberation theory had in Montreal, the effects of global decolonization on Canada, I think, have been largely forgotten. For those living in Montreal during the 60s and 70s, the importance of this larger global context was impossible to ignore. It was very much in the air that they breathed. Now what I want to do today is to explore how the history of Montreal in the 1960s, something that we at least all have some kind of vague knowledge of or vague memory of. I want to think about how it looks differently if we take into account this larger transnational context, specifically the context of third world decolonization. But I also want to try to think about how it looks differently if we also take into account the complexities of the urban context of the city, a city which was very much linguistically and ethnically divided during the 1960s, but was also one with a great deal of cross-fertilization. We have three parts to tonight's uh, lecture. I'm going to start off by talking about theory and the city. And what I mean by this. I'm going to begin by looking at the role of ideas derived from third world decolonization movements to efforts of reimagining the city during the 1960s. To put it slightly differently, how a reimagining of the symbolic meanings of particular spaces in the city helped fuel a global imagination about local and transnational structures of power. Secondly, I'm going to talk about activism in the city, the development of grassroots urban activism, citizens' committees in Montreal's working-class neighborhoods, as well as labor activism and the politicization of a whole variety of different social movements in the 1960s. <coughs> and finally, in the third part, and this is what I really want to argue, is that although these two movements, these two developments, remained apart for much of the decade, when they finally merged at the end of the 1960s, the results were explosive, giving birth to some of the largest and most dynamic far-reaching protests that North America had ever seen, culminating in a massive general strike in 1972, when around 300,000 workers walked off the job. The Quebec, the Quebec working class really became politicized to an extent not witnessed in North America since 1919. Now, studies of the 1960s in Quebec have, until rather recently, been framed within the context of the province's history. Seen from this angle, the social conditions of the 1950s, the particularities of Quebec society, provide the backdrop for the explosion of political activity in the 1960s, which in turn is seen as the historical origins of the present. Now this interpretation, of course, speaks to an important dimension of the political activism of the period, and the changing political, economic, and demographic structures of Quebec in many ways, really provide the ground upon which labor movements would develop. But Montreal did not live the 60s on its own. 
And in addition to understanding the local environment, it's also necessary to look across borders in order to situate the political developments in the city in the larger realm of global descent. Now, throughout the, the 1960s, international literature really filled the, the shelves of Montreal bookstores and the private homes of individuals. Scores of international activists and intellectuals passed through the city, including many of the most important theorists of the era. Groups and individuals sent copies of their material to like-minded organizations around the world, from Havana to Buenos Aires to Berkeley. Well-known literary figures like Hubert Hakan traveled to Africa and into Europe to meet with the leaders of the African decolonization movement. Now, when I first uh, set out on this research, I have to admit uh, my surprise when I realized the extent and scope of anti-colonial politics in Montreal in the 1960s. I soon realized I wasn't alone, that many other people were also skeptical, including some of the major anti-colonial thinkers of the world at this time, people like Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Mamie, Aimé Césaire. I remained a bit skeptical, as did they. Although it's important to note, out that, no, to, to note that every single one of those speakers eventually came around to understand the legitimacy that something was, was happening uh, in Quebec. Now certainly one of the most problematic aspects of this transposition of anti-colonial theory into Montreal, at least initially, was its lack of recognition of the multiple levels of colonialism in Quebec and specifically the lack of consideration of the history of marginalization of First Nation peoples in the province. This changed somewhat in the late 1960s and early 1970s, as some intellectuals began to seriously grapple with these issues. So in many ways, it's with an eye on this paradox, it very much is a paradox, how a white North American society could draw upon ideas that were developed in very different circumstances, that I set out to begin uh, this line of questioning or this research. Despite their problematic nature, however, ideas of Quebec anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism can, I don't think, simply be dismissed because they prove to be incredibly powerful. They are incredibly, incredibly powerful in catalyzing a whole series of mass movements that significantly shape the development of Quebec society. So we really have to try to understand them, I think. So the question, therefore, becomes, why did this theory, which was developed so far away in such different locations and different political struggles, have such a profound effect in Montreal during the 1960s? For young radicals coming of age in the 1960s, the language of decolonization, which it, with its emphasis on Quebec's cultural and economic alienation, provided a new framework within which they could understand their own anxieties, their own experiences, and their own dreams. I think that it's impossible to understand the power of third world liberation theory without understanding the particular dynamics of urban life in Montreal. The widely cited statistics of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, a commission established by the federal government in response to the nationalist upsurge of the 1960s, <coughs> provided statistically, statistical proof of the discrimination that many Francophones had been feeling for years. In 1961, a 35% difference in average income separated uh, Anglophones and Francophones. And statistics which correlate income with ethnicity found that Francophones ranked 12th of 14 ethnic groups in the province. 56% of Montreal's region best paid workers were Anglophones, although they made up only 24% of the labor force. And while 78% of Francophones earning over $5,000 needed to speak English on the job, the ability to work in French was required for only 14% of Anglophones in the same wage range. Although Francophones comprised the vast majority of Quebec's population, they controlled only 20% of its economy. And with 27% of Canada's population, the province contained 40% of the country's unemployed workers. And these, uh, these statistics were really felt in the most dramatic way in Montreal, in the most intense way, most acutely. Another aspect of Montreal during the 1960s uh, is that there was a certain racialization of Francophones. Walking downtown uh, Montreal in the early 1960s speaking English, or sorry, speaking in French, someone could tell you to speak white, uh, to speak English, uh, to speak the language of the white civilized world. So there was this form of racialization which existed as well. Now Montreal acted as the site for the vast majority of political confrontations during the 1960s. It was home to nearly all, or the vast majority of the intellectuals and artists 
to the, who work to develop new radical interpretations of Quebec society. Political groups existed. <coughs> uh, uh, political groups often scarcely existed outside of Montreal. And in Montreal, unlike many other parts of Quebec, uh, bookstores were scattered through, scattered through the downtown, ensuring that journals such as Papier Prix, one of the most important journals of the period, uh, could achieve widespread distribution within the city, but very little distribution elsewhere. But both the, the, the concentration of highly politicized intellectuals and activists and the blending of linguistic and ethnic groups created an explosive political climate in the city that, although it spread outwards to other directions, it wasn't really reproduced elsewhere. It was really a, a Montreal phenomenon. Now, the city wasn't only a, a, a location of an overwhelming amount of political activity. It also acted as a physical and symbolic incarnation of the cultural and economic exploitation that was to be resisted and overturned. In the lived and imagined geographies of everyday life, the city, divided into two distinct, opposed, and contrasting sections, became a physical manifestation for the colonial relationship that Montreal's radical thinkers attempted to overturn. For Michel Van Schendel, for example, you quote, Montreal makes us think of the luxurious cities of South America, of North and Sub-Saharan Africa, Rio de Janeiro, Tangiers, Casablanca, Dakar the largely French-speaking working class living in the neighborhoods to the east, and the English-speaking middle and upper classes living in the high-scale neighborhoods to the west, radical Francophone theorists began to map linguistic and ethnic identity onto social class, seeing Montreal almost as a classic colonial city. Montreal was both linguistically and ethnically divided, and these divisions were represented, although imperfectly, in its geography. The center of Montreal was dominated by Mount, Mount Royal, on which stood the stately buildings of the English-speaking, very prestigious McGill University. To the west of McGill, still high on the mountain, was a predominantly English-speaking westbound, a neighborhood which had become symbolic of Anglophone uh, domination. If you head straight down from westbound, you headed into a completely different world. You headed into the, the slums of saint Avi very much a working class Francophone neighborhood. Now these geographies of power shaped the imagination of young writers in Montreal in the 1960s, giving a daily experiential feeling of being colonized. And it's out of this experience that they were able to draw these kind of metaphorical links between themselves and the third world. Now above all, the symbolic center of revolt in the 1960s was East Montreal the traditional neighborhoods of the Francophone working class. East Montreal symbolized, in many ways, the alienation, symbolized marginalization. But it also represented hope and possibility. As Sherry Simon writes, in the late 1960s, to travel east through Montreal was not only to voyage into the working class slums, but it was also to move in the direction of the future. Radicals began valorizing the East End with its colloquial French and working class housing, while at the same time denouncing the grandeur and arrogance of the West End. For André Major, a young writer who had grown up in the rough East End, no matter where he went in life, he would always remain a guy from Ontario Street. This is his, uh, his quotation. His soul, he argued, was of the East. The residents of East Montreal spoke Joël, or colloquial street French filled with English expressions, faulty syntax, grammatical mistakes. Gérard Godin, who was one of the most ardent defenders of the use of joie in writing uh, Quebec literature in the 1960s, wrote that Quebec writers need to refuse to use proper French, which would merely gloss over the decaying language of the people. It was not proper French which needed to be defended, he argued, but the pride and liberty of the population itself. His hope was born out of the alienation of East Montreal. Now, Don Mitchell argues that conflict over social justice, conflicts over social justice, are also conflicts about space and geography. As Montreal's Francophone majority was, to a large extent, spatially confined to particular neighborhoods, any counter-hegemonic movement would therefore need to challenge the dominant control over public space in the city. Yet just as theorists of national liberation were drawing 
portraits of Montreal as a city of ethnic and linguistic absolutes. These strict divisions of the city were continually being contradicted by the realities of daily life. Montreal is a complicated and multifaceted city, and the histories of its many different groups and individuals both intersect and overlap. Many radicals felt alienated by the segregated nature of the city. They also constructed alternative spaces in which debate and discussion could thrive. During this period, there's an incredible proliferation of journals, of cafes, of meeting places. Journals such as Parti Prix, Révolution Québécoise, Socialisme 64, the McGill Daily, Our Generation Against Nuclear War, the last post, we often forget about the Anglophone groups that were very much involved in what was happening in Montreal in the 1960s. Through these journals, young readers learned of events taking place in Vietnam, in Cuba, in Africa, in Latin America, and elsewhere around the world. They would soon come to see themselves not so much as being in solidarity with these various struggles, but as actually forming one part of this larger movement, uh, which very much was a movement conceived as a movement against the global power of empire, often increasingly in the late 1960s, the power of American imperialism around the world. Many of these journals at the time often had uh, political education discussions as part of their program. Uh, Pelti Pri, for example, uh, would publish an edition of this journal and then have discussion groups, have political education classes around it. Now, we don't want to romanticize, of course, these cafes and meeting places. In many ways, these spaces were very much gendered spaces. Uh, and the Montreal left was often a thoroughly male place, at least until the, the late 1960s and early 1970s. Women were excluded both literally and metaphorically. They were often relegated to secondary roles within various different political organizations. Now, speaking of Parti Pris specifically, which was probably the most important journal, cultural political journal of the 1960s, I think it's important to note that this journal actually became very important for the political education of a whole bunch of people who would go on to play very different roles in political movements. Uh, in fact, many of the women who would go on to form the Women's Liberation Movement, which really took hold in 1968-69 in Montreal, were first introduced to radical politics through the journal Parti Pris and the meetings and courses that it offered. For example, Nicole Terrien recalls first learning about history, economics, and politics through Pelti Pri's public meetings. Compared to her, er her earlier religious education, she considered Pelti that Pelti Pri acted, along with the labor movement, as her first real school. At least partly out of the analyses of Pelti Pri, the frustration engendered by its exclusion of women really resulted in the fact that Montreal's specific manifestations of feminism would be both possible as well as necessary. Now, Montreal was also important, the site of Montreal, the site of the city was also important for a number of reasons, for a, for a number of other reasons. It was the site of an incredible degree of, of creativity, of cultural mixing, of hybridization. In the very early 1960s, many of the city's young Francophone Bohemian poets, artists, and chansonniers <coughs> began meeting in a cafe called Le Mans, the third floor loft on St. Dominic Street, just above Sherbrooke. In the late night atmosphere, among poet mixed poetry, music, and art, discussion topics increasingly drifted towards a new climate of political rebellion. Situated at the crossroads of different worlds, just one street east of saint laurent saint laurent is the street that runs down, right down the center of Montreal, that divides symbolically, at least, the French-speaking east half of Montreal from the English-speaking west half of Montreal. So just one street east of, of, of saint laurent this traditional dividing line, and in a neighborhood composed largely of European immigrants and working-class Francophones, Le, Le Mac maintained this vibrant dynamism. Politicized Francophone artists interacted with the jazz musicians who played throughout the night, and these two different expressions of rebellion really collided. This was also reproduced in a whole no number of other cafes and meeting places in the 1960s. By the middle of the decade, there was really two venues that became the center uh, avant-garde radical cafes in Montreal in the 1960s. One was called the Swiss Hut, and the other the Association Española, both situated on Sherbrooke Street, near Lurie. These have really become the dominant spaces, the dominant meeting spaces. They were frequented by all the various different currents of opposition in the city, both Anglophone and Francophone, anarchists and communists, pacifists, revolutionary, all different types. 
For Francophone radicals who had been confined to the eastern part of the city, going to these cafes such as the Swiss Hud and the Asociación Española represented a symbolic burst westwards, bringing them into contact with a whole array of radicals of, of a wide variety of different stripes. The Asociación Española was frequented, for example, by a whole variety or a whole important clientele of Spanish anarchists who had come to Montreal after the Spanish Civil War. It was also frequented by members of the Francophone left and by a whole variety of Anglophone radicals who were increasingly radicalized um, by the student movement at McGill University, which started off very much um, uh, organized around anti-nuclear issues and then moved to a number of other issues throughout the 1960s. But one of the great ironies of the period, I think, is that it was in these hybrid spaces, these spaces of mixing, that some of these Francophone intellectuals started developing their new interpretations of Montreal through which they read the city through a lens of spatialized linguistic and ethnic absolutes. So it was in the very spaces of mixing that they began thinking about the city as being completely divided. Mm. But dissent wasn't only fomenting in downtown cafes and in downtown meeting places. This moves on to the second part of my lecture. One part of 60s radicalism, which I think is often forgotten, is the dynamic and remarkable world of grassroots activism. While the city's cafes and universities overflowed with a, uh, intellectual and artistic energy, the rumblings of revolt could also be heard in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods of the city. saint avi and Point saint charles located in the southwestern part of the city, their traditional homes of the working class, homes to populations that were largely French Canadian and of Irish descent. Now throughout much of the 20th century, workers from these neighborhoods labored in the factories that bordered the Lachine Canal. Many left school to work in factories at a young age. Now these neighborhoods had been in the sites of important labor battles stretching all the way back to the 19th century. But by the 1960s, the region had been going through a period of deindustrialization and decline. The neighborhoods were poor, but in the 1960s, they were also becoming sites of resistance, and they would eventually inspire grass grassroots initiatives across the entire city. At the beginning of the 1960s, the Conseil des Oeuvres de Montréal began to hire social animators, <coughs> and these social animators would organize residents of southwestern Montreal premised on the belief that citizens could break, could be mobilized to resolve problems related to their daily lives. This social animation sought to break down feelings of apathy and isolation and to build grassroots democracy. In 1963, for example, a group of parents in saint Alvi got together to demand that a new school be built to replace a dilapidated and dangerous one. Out of parents' committees came a host of others, organizing popular education courses, fighting unjust zoning laws, demanding more democratic forms of urban renewal. Now, the activity in saint Avi catalyzed the emergence of similar groups in close by Point saint Charles. And before, before long, the Federation of Movements in Southwestern Montreal, a group which had a more clearly defined ideology, emerged and had the intention of organizing all of these different disparate groups. As the decade progressed, other popular institutions began to, to emerge. Community activists drew inspiration from Saul Alinsky. Worker priests in the neighborhood, and this was very much an important aspect of, of uh, political activism in Montreal in the 1960s, or left Catholic figures, worker priests, some drawing on traditions of the worker priest tradition coming out of Europe, some very much influenced by liberation theology currents coming out of Latin America. They set themselves to the cause invested in the project of empowering the poor and the dispossessed. In Point St. Charles, citizens began organizing consumer co-ops and collective kitchens, fighting for greater community control over the streets and schools, forming organizations to fight landlords and welfare agents. In St. Avi, a citizen's bookstore was opened. Citizens began to understand not only the structural roots of poverty, but also their own potential to shape the world around them. It's also the development of uh, popular medical clinics, popular legal clinics. The legacies of all of this are still very much present in Montreal society today. Now in the 1960s, uh, women were generally expected to be responsible for the private sphere, which involved tasks like dealing with landlords and welfare agents, 
seeing to the safety of children. As such, activism around these issues generally felt to them, and it's important to note, important to recognize, that women form the majority of these various community groups and citizens' committees. In the process, many became more conscious of the multiple forms of oppression that they faced. As one woman from the Ashlega Mezunev Citizens' Committee put it, through community activism, power and authority were being demystified and therefore challenged and contested. Move on to the third part. I want to talk about the way in which some of this activism uh, that was emerging in the very different sectors of some of the working class and poor neighborhoods of Montreal began merging with some of that intellectual production that I talked about at the beginning. By the late 1960s, it was quite clear that many different forms of activism were taking place in the city. All these different groups with different intellectual origins uh, and different organizational histories mm -hmm. as well began emerging in a, in a major way and began converging the larger politics, larger language of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. Now, one example of this type of, of merging was the development of feminism in Montreal, the Women's Liberation Movement, uh, which very much began as a project of contesting the larger structures of, of dissent, as well as challenging some of the gendered spaces in the city itself. Very much around laying claim to certain aspects of the city. In fact, the very first protest of the Women's Liberation Movement took place on the 28th of November, 1969, uh, was uh, over demanding and demonstrating the right of people to protest in the city of Montreal. The municipal administration, and in fact, passed a bylaw ban banning all protests in the city. And it was women who first organized uh, to lay claim to the city. Other actions which took place were such things as uh, occupying taverns, taverns which excluded women uh, up, right up uh, until the late 1960s and early 1970s in Quebec. But it's also important to note that the early history of the women's liberation movement, which very much drew on Anglophone and Francophone traditions, uh, Anglophone women, some of whom were draft dodgers coming up from the United States, very much influenced by uh, American women's liberation theory, Francophone women very much emerging out of the Quebec labor movement and other popular movements. Together, they formed an organization called the FLF, the Fonds de Liberation des Femmes du Québec. The main slogan was no liberation of Quebec without the liberation of women, no liberation of women without the liberation of Quebec. Now, women's liberation was just one of the social movements that was emerging. We also saw the incredible radicalization of the student movement, which would go on to paralyze the province's new junior college system in the fall of 1968. We saw the development of uh, the radicalization of Montreal's Caribbean population, the development of black power, occupation of Sir George Williams uh, University, the Computer Center in 1969, and the blows of riot, these $2 million of damage, and catalyzed a whole series of popular revolts throughout the Anglophone Caribbean. But also, the development of language politics, which had been simmering beneath the surface throughout the 1960s very much exploded in 1969 with a massive march, 10 to 15,000 people walked uh, to McGill University. They were demanding that McGill University become a university that served the uh, Francophone working class of the city. But we really saw the coming together of all of these different movements. They had all shared certain intellectual grammars of dissent around this language of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. These protests throughout the city uh, in the late 1960s, often marched from uh, east to west, very symbolic. Uh, this was certainly the case for the Miguel Francais movement in March of uh, 1969. It uh, started at Café saint louis in the east end of downtown Montreal, marching west to Miguel, trying to lay claim to the city. <clears throat> very symbolic. It was about asserting one's right to the city, Bora <coughs> Henri Lefebvre's term. Often these various different movements stretched and adapt anti-colonial ideas. They're often recrafted crafted these ideas for their own particular needs. And this is certainly what happened when we saw the coming together of some of this grassroots activism with this larger world of intellectual dissent. The merging of these ideals of popular democracy with a program for working class power took its most concrete form with the founding of the FRAP in 1970 which is a radical municipal party that would bring a major challenge to the municipal administration during the October 1970 municipal election. The immediate origins of the FRAP 
Go back to the 19th of May, 1968, when 175 activists representing 20 different citizen communities from all over the city met in a St. Albans school to discuss their common problems and their common belief in the necessity of taking political action. The idea of organizing a political party began to spread. And in the fall of the following year, community organizers and activists planned a series of popular assemblies in Montreal's neighborhoods. At the particular Montreal conference, activists and students uh, came together, uh, community organizations as well, radical intellectuals, the labor movement, is really coming together of all of these different threads. They came together to found the political party of the FAP. The FAP's 1970 publication, the Salarié au pouvoir, a document that outlines the party's political program and philosophy, describes the painful dehumanization and marginalization of workers and the distance that separated them from society's decision-making making structures. While workers in Montreal lived in poor housing, chronic debt, and with the reality of plant closings and unemployment, the flat argued, the city of Montreal chose to devote its energy to investing in mega-projects of prestige, from Expo 67 to the Place des Arts. And eventually, they would, uh, the same kind of world of grassroots activism would very much oppose the Olympics in 1976. Building on the insights and of theorists of the early 1960s, the FRAP wrote about how in Montreal, like Quebec as a whole, workers occupied subordinate positions in industries controlled by Americans and English Canadians. And the living conditions of workers, made up largely of Francophones, but also of immigrants, did not cease to deteriorate. In Montreal, where 75% of families were renters, forging democracy necessarily entailed a vast program of urban renovation including massive construction of public housing, complete with parks and daycares. If the flat came to power, the program declared, citizens would decide on public planning through public assembly, power would be decentralized, and development would no longer be controlled by the private sphere. Community health clinics would be established, and in addition to having abortion services, clinics run by citizens become centers of popular education. Flat's program was vast. And its program, even for the most ardent of socialists, was somewhat utopian. But what the party did do, however, was hold out a vision of what it called the form of democracy that would be lived in the everyday. By uniting many of the different worlds of the left in the late 1960s, many believed that the FAP represented the emergence of a strong and coherent movement, one based on the twin poles of working class political agency fighting the structures of empire and grassroots democracy. The FRAP was, it, at the very beginning of its existence and in the midst of its first municipal election campaign, when the political climate of the city drastically, was drastically transformed by the events of October 1970. Now this merging of different theoretical developments, very much emerged out of the city and based fundamentally on representations of the city. It's merging of that with the emergence of a whole variety of different social movements create the conditions for an explosion of mass politics rarely seen in North American history. Now, rather than dying down in the aftermath of the October crisis, politicalization only increased to new levels. Now, um, during the October crisis, as much of the political opposition collapsed under repression, 500 people arrested, uh, tens of thousands of searches, uh, etc., uh, the labor movement was really the one movement that stood up and defended uh, civil liberties in a very strong way. And it represented a new moment where the labor movement came together uh, and began uh, rejecting the vision of democracy pronounced by the government as well as the actions of the FLQ and proposing its own vision of government and its own vision of democracy. This was very much uh, indebted to all of this theoretical work and all of this grassroots activism which had been taking place uh, since the beginning of, of the 1960s. Really, with the labor movement, what happened in the early 1970s is they published uh, each of the main labor uh, organizations, the CSM, the FDQ, and the CUQ, uh, published uh, a manifesto which was distributed all throughout the province, which represented labor's own interpretations of grassroots democracy, uh, as well as anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism. It's really this distribution of these ideas on a mass scale that led to that general strike in 1972, which I alluded to at the beginning. Now, throughout this entire period, 
think we could say that there's an incredible proliferation of activism, a mass politicization of everyday life. And this was really through, at least partly through an engagement with the larger politics of empire, as well as with the politics of the city. Through the coming together of these two different threads, citizens began organizing their local communities, they created daycares and medical clinics, they formed organizations in defense of the rights of tenants and the unemployed. Groups formed all different types of political parties. They, they staged mass demonstrations. They organized within their unions and they founded publications devoted to political analysis and to poetry. The politicization was so profound that it was estimated that in the years following 1965, some 2,000 popular groups were formed. Women challenged the everyday dismissals and devaluation which they experienced in wider society and with popular, within popular movements. Caribbean and black activists challenged racism, and thousands demanded that the economic, cultural, political, and education structures be brought under democratic control. It's this diversity and depth of political thought and action that I think needs to be understood and thought about critically, so that it has had a deep and lasting effect on Quebec society. Its effects are still felt in a powerful way to this day. The ultimate effect of all of this political activity, I think, can be registered in the transformed nature of everyday life in the province in the 1970s and beyond. As I said at the beginning, cities are incubators of social change, They're both symbolic and actual sites of power, and therefore also of resistance to that power. All throughout the period, reading their local struggles through a global lens allowed many, to quote Greg Grandin, to experience the world not in its illusionary static present, but as evolving, as susceptible to change through action. The adaptation of anti-colonial ideas to Quebec society was neither clear, linear, nor without significant contradiction. By the early 1970s, many troubling questions began to surface. The gendered nature of the movement was being actively contested, as was its use of racial metaphors. Cities are important sites of intellectual and theoretical production. But this partly means that they're not always receptive to events and people outside of, outside of their view. The central contradiction which stood at the very core of the broadly defined movement in Quebec, the absence of a serious reflection of the multi multiple levels of colonialism in the province, would be made, made painfully clear with the Quebec government's announcement of the James Bay Project in the Quebec North in 1971. And First Nations resistance to this project came very much strangely as a surprise to me. Conceptions of, of decolonization proved to be very powerful, yet they were also highly contingent. And at least partly because of the latent contradictions contained within them, ultimately they were disposable. Rather than disappearing, however, the political energies of these various movements that were shaped by them became embedded in the very fabric of Quebec society and in many ways, I think we could say, very much changed its nature. The complex legacies of these movements can still be felt to this day. Thank you. Okay, sure. I'm going to let uh, Sean fill questions from uh, the audience for some 15 20 minutes. Um, so the floor is yours. As I was listening to you, I was struck by what was not mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that was capitalism. Oh, um, interesting. And I was thinking, <laughs> capitalism. does this speak to 2011 or does it speak to uh, 1964? Um, certainly, uh, in my interactions with students, sure. what I report to be on black. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a kind of embarrassing silence about capitalism. But that really wasn't true in the 1960s. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how anti-capitalism mm -hmm. fit into the ensemble of black Sure, that's a, it's an excellent question. Um, the answer would be that anti-capitalist politics in Quebec was very much structured through the language of anti-colonialism. I mean, the, the entire premise of anti-colonial and anti-imperialist thought in Quebec was that capitalism itself was an imperialist form of production. I mean, this is certainly the interpretation in the latter half of, of the 1960s. 
all of the organizations essentially that I talked about, maybe a little bit less some of the grassroots movements in the early 1960s, but certainly the, the main um, uh, theoretical journals of the era, Parti Pris and, and others, uh, were very much based on a third world Marxist idea of the necessity of readapting and re-understanding Marxism for uh, local environments, trying to recraft and rethink uh, about how to understand the best ways to challenge the capitalist system. Now, major kind of paradigm shift happened in the early 19, or in the mid 1960s with the development of a journal called Révolution Québécoise, which introduced a far more Marxist interpretation of capitalism, which represented a shift away from some of the more cultural anti-colonial politics, which was represented very much in, in Parti Pris, etc. Uh, and when um, the turn towards a very kind of distinct turn towards anti-capitalism uh, began to be made, very strong shift from looking at colonialism towards looking at anti-imperialism, looking at the center of, 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 of the capitalist system in North America, which was seen to be the United States. And capitalism was very much seen to be the root of the American imperialist project. And therefore, uh, it followed uh, from this analysis that it was important for Francophone Quebecers to link up in very important ways with other marginalized groups who were marginalized not only through capitalism, but also uh, based on their uh, race or ethnicity uh, to oppose that system because they were seen to be the true revolutionary class. Right? And this is where you start to see people like Pierre Verrier and Charles Gagnon very much um, drawing upon the uh, black Marxist tradition in the United States, very much making links with monthly review, uh, traveling to New York with that express purpose of um, meeting up with American Marxists as well as with the kind of black left in the United States with the idea of forging these links as Quebecers as well as American blacks uh, and Chicanos were seen, this was the, you know, from their particular perspective as the three groups in North America who really could pose a revolutionary challenge to the capitalist system. Now, you know, continue this anti-capitalism just became more and more important certainly uh, when these anti-imperialist ideas became became adopted by uh, the labor movement uh, the labor movement uh, the CSN in particular was uh, focused incredibly on anti-capitalism and they published a whole series of manifestos talking about the necessity to absolutely transform the uh, system of production but that was all shaped through a specific lens of reading uh, about the imperialist nature of the capitalist system. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about the kind of sources you've been engaging with in this study? Sure, absolutely. Uh, a whole variety of different sources. I mean, of course, um, you know, the, the easiest place to begin is with the incredible uh, array of, of intellectual and cultural production during the period. You know, there's, um, you, know, you could probably start reading now and not uh, finish until the, you know, if you read just that until the rest of your life. And there's an incredible amount of, of intellectual production produced uh, during this period. Now, um, having said that, it's obviously necessary to go into you know, archives, try to understand some of the other sides of this. I did um, work in, uh, uh, you know, did oral history as well, talked to various different activists. What's really important and what I really learned through this entire process is a way in which archives, um, you know, it seems that's such an obvious point, but archives have politics of their own. Uh, and archives shape forms of knowledge in their own right. There's an absolutely incredible archive in Montreal, which is uh, the archives of UCAM. Uh, and at the archive of UCAM, um, it's basically an archive of the history of, of the left. And uh, the left and social movements, and, and you know, they have uh, documents from all varieties of different groups, and one could write it whole number of very interesting dissertations and books out of the archives which they have there. However, if you just based your knowledge uh, uh, of Quebec social movements in the 1960s based on what was that, what is that UCAM, you would miss a great deal uh, because they had a particular politics of production of those particular archives. For me, what was extremely important was to uh, include in this politic, in this project, and it's something I didn't have a chance to talk about very much, but I have a very long chapter on Caribbean politics and black power and in particular Montreal manifestations of that and how they, uh, activists emerging out of that world, engaged with this larger world of Francophone anti-colonial.
theory. And to get at that, it's necessary to go to community-based archives, to try and make connections in the community. There's a very important institution in Montreal called the Alfie Roberts Institute, which helped me a great deal. Um, get at grassroots politics once again. You have to look often at local archives. You have to talk to, to, to local activists. So it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing project, and there's not one set of sources or one methodology of getting at that source. It's necessary to use a whole range of different ideas. But to think very seriously about how particular archives and particular sources could shape or predetermine the questions that we ask of those, that particular material. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about the municipal political party, the mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering or interested in if there was any formal or informal relationship with the PQ and, uh, or if there was any sort of disagreements about, you know, you talked about that they were interested in community democracy and that sort of thing. Right. Did they have a relationship with the same people? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And where the PQ fits into this story is a very interesting one. Because, of course, the PQ, founded in 1968, was very much based on the idea of a locally based democracy, um, about forming a mass political party that would not uh, uh, be under the influence of corporate power. It was very much thought to be an alternative uh, movement, but very much also was based on kind of a, a reformed nationalist politics. Um, now, there's certainly no formal relationship between the FRAP and the, the, the PQ. Uh, in fact, uh, in the early 1970s, something that's often I think, misunderstood is there's an incredible degree of antagonism between the PQ and, and many social movements, and certainly between the PQ and the labor movement, which was very heavily invested in the, in the FRAP. Where you see the actual collaboration is on the ground, in fact, where uh, many kind of locally based activists themselves, uh, despite the fact that their theoretical and political leaders talked about the contradictions between the various different movements, in fact, were very much involved in organizing across different political spheres. So I'm sure that many people who were involved in the FRAP uh, were also very much involved in the PQ, although there was no formal relationship at the party level. The idea of the FRAP uh, was trying to build on the you know, tradition that comes out of, of Europe, the idea that one could build social, a socialist base in the cities and then from there move on to move on to, to larger levels, the provincial level or the national level. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a question about the indigenous. Yeah, please. Uh, two. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just mention them both. And then sure. So the first one is, um, how was James Bay received mm. by the, the yeah. groups that you're talking about? And then the second one is, in terms of more local indigenous, mm. uh, were the Mohawk perceived as part of the Anglophone community or something like that? Was there a kind of a, an issue that way yeah. about, because uh, you would have thought that at some level there might be some solidarity. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. The uh, excellent question. Thank you for that. The, um, there's a very famous moment in 1965 when Contina Horan came before the, the hearings of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism and said, um, in fact, the um, French Canadians were not one of the founding races, but they were the first, the first invading race. <laughs> uh, so you know, very much, uh, uh, you can see this certain antagonism to some of the politics that were developing uh, at this uh, at this time. So off with the question on James Bay, one thing I, 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 I didn't do in this talk, but I think it's important to give some credit to some of the, um, the intellectuals uh, of the you know, various movements, and broadly we could say the New Left in Quebec, who actually, beginning in the late 1960s, and certainly by the early 1970s, really were trying in an incredibly serious way to, to think about Aboriginal politics in Quebec. One uh, very good example of this is uh, still to this day, I presume, uh, the best-selling histories of Quebec of all time is a book uh, by Léon Bergeron called The Petit Manuel d'Histoire du Québec. And Léon Bergeron uh, was in fact originally from Manitoba, and he taught at Sir George, he was teaching French at Sir George Williams University during the occupation of the Black Sea. So he was very much attuned to what was happening. But he became uh, deeply involved in the Quebec labor movement in the CSN and began giving worker education courses of Quebec history in these kind of locally uh, based um, education groups within the CSN as well as within some of these citizen groups. And out of that uh, emerged this, uh, this book. 
And the book is actually an amazing book to read because you see he's, he's trying to grapple with the multiple levels of colonialism in Quebec with the various um, uh, different ways in which colonialism operates, very much starting off with uh, you know, Aboriginal colonization and then talking about you know, Francophone colonization of Aboriginal colonization. And you start to see ways in which he's starting to imagine uh, alliances that could possibly uh, come together in some kind of larger political struggle. There's a very, very long section on Louis Riel as well. Um, so, he, I mean, he's, he's one example, but he's not the only one. Pierre Verrier himself, the author of Negro Blanc d'Amérique, very much, you know, which is a book very much based on his kind of own uh, subjective experience of colonialism in Quebec, a very masculinist book, uh, himself in 1971 says very clearly that Francophones are not the most oppressed people in Quebec, that there are also immigrants as well as Aboriginals. Uh, most clearly where you see this happening is uh, in the ranks of the radical element of the Quebec labor movement, which is specifically uh, the aspect of the CSN, which is called the Montreal Central Council of the CSN, bringing together all of the Montreal local unions uh, within the CSN. Uh, and if you start looking through their publication, you see all kinds of support for, for, for Aboriginal groups, um, uh, for, you know, very much in support of the resistance to, to James Bay. Uh, you know, during the, uh, you know, there's large solidarity rallies in Montreal during the, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the coup in Chile in 1973. A massive, massive meeting at the Forum, Montreal Forum, at which they bring Aboriginal uh, representatives to speak to this large crowd. Uh, you know, if we look at radical documentaries of the period, Je Gou, for example, uh, Vingateur ou plus, talking about 1971 and the La Presse strike, this kind of very ardent moment of anti-capitalist opposition, this is a major strike uh, against that place newspaper in 1961, during which one young woman was killed in a protest in downtown Montreal. Uh, and in this movie, which uh, very much documenting the anger of the Montreal working class, automatically switches to Aboriginal politics. And so you see people are really trying to grapple with this in the, 19, in the early 1970s. My argument is that they tried to grapple with it, but ultimately the contradiction was just too great. Uh, and in fact, this whole paradigm of anti-colonialism disappears. It gives way very much to a, a much more strict uh, understanding of Marxism and anti-capitalist politics, which really became dominant throughout the 1970s. That, and then, of course, the reform nationalism, of, which is embodied in the PQ. Um, you had another side of the question. Oh, right. The, well, to tell you the truth, throughout the, most of the 1960s, the Quebec left was incredibly blind to Aboriginal people. It did not even necessarily recognize that the Mohawk were, were, were so close by. Um, go there, yeah. um, did the uh, political dynamism of Montreal have a catalytic effect on other major urban centers in, uh, in Quebec? I'm thinking, I guess, primarily of Quebec City. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't, uh, why didn't it? Yeah, the, excellent, um, excellent question. Uh, Quebec City has always been a bit of a, a strange case. I've never, uh, <laughs> never completely understood it. Um, the, um, what we really start seeing in the early 1970s is that, in fact, the shift of radicalism is beginning to take a, is beginning to happen in a very serious way away from Montreal, but it, it actually moves uh, to uh, resource towns to the North Shore. During the general strike of 1972, the major um, uh, occupations are taking place in the Gaspés, the Bay Como, uh, and they become the, the real sites of, of working class uh, opposition. Certainly in Quebec City, there were intellectual threats, there were citizen groups, uh, there was political opposition, but Montreal really was the, the kind of hotspot for all of, uh, all of that activity. But certainly it spread by where it was actually surpassed, where the, the radicalism of places outside of Montreal, surpassed out of Montreal, was with the North Shore of the Gaspé City during the, the general strike of 1972. Yeah? Montreal is a unique form of uh, municipal organization it's always been a long time party, pure party politics. Mm -hmm. And during the 60s, you had a francophone mayor and administration. Who was supporting that party? Mm -hmm. And what effect to the victor goes to the spoils may have had on the disadvantaged areas of Montreal or the people that don't support that party? Vancouver is probably the one other exception 
Yeah. Sure. Basically, this whole organization is supposedly the theory is consensus, you know, from yeah, the shape. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we have to understand the, the incredible, you know, the, the, the world of political activism was incredibly powerful in Montreal, of course. Um, but the other aspect of, of, of the 1960s was, which wasn't only in Montreal, but elsewhere you know, um, throughout the Western world, was this incredible drive of modernist development, right, of, of, of reshaping cities, of crafting cities. And it was incredibly seductive. It was supported by certainly financial interests. And we have to remember the particular uh, nature of um, enfranchisement in Montreal right up until the late 1960s because Montreal was such a, uh, a city dominated so heavily by renters and because the electoral system was slanted in favor of, of landlords and owners. Uh, in fact, there was significant elements of disenfranchisement right up, uh, you know, right up until the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, you know, so, I mean, the drapeau stood very much for uh, you know, opening the city to the world, to mega projects, to ur modernist urban development, and also increasingly to law and security, right? uh, and that you know certainly has a, a political base uh, then as it does today. Um, yeah. What, what do you see the cities today? Are they incubators of new knowledge, or those places where we go to have battles in Seattle? <laughs> uh, that, that's an excellent question. I mean, I I, you know, I hope to learn. That from you about Victoria. Um, in my, you know, the cities I, I know well are, are Montreal and Toronto, um, and uh, you know, I know Quebec City as well. <laughs> this period, this earlier. Uh, <laughs> and and in my estimation, uh, the cities very much are incubators of new knowledge. There are places, and there are very much places where you have a uh, mixing of different groups, uh, people coming in and out in various ways, uh, large meeting places or sites of symbolic protest. I mean, I'm, I'm certain that someone would say Cairo right now is a very important place where people are thinking very seriously about new ideas in all kinds of different ways. Partly because of their symbolic power, partly because of uh, the, the just the sheer concentration of intellectuals and activists and what happens in various different spaces in particular urban environments. Are they the only incubators of new knowledge? Absolutely not. They, you know, knowledge can be created in all kinds of other places as well. And I think as I tried to to indicate here, there are some problems sometimes when cities are incubators of new knowledge because there are some things that they don't necessarily see which lie outside of, you know, outside of their particular view. Thank you. Yeah. You've mentioned Expo 67 a couple of times and I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit on what effect the incredible focus um, placed upon Montreal through that event might have had in um, animating you know, the great transformations in the city of the period? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, question. And it's, you know, a lot of focus that was placed on Montreal uh, for a, a long period of time, right, because there was a whole construction uh, of Expo, etc. I mean, one, in concrete ways, a lot of people were coming to the city, including large dignitaries, this, you know, uh, Nixon came to the city at one point. And the, this became a, a, a focus for a political protest, of course. But more to the point, I would say, the construction, the incredible fueling of the construction industry from Expo fueled certain forms of labor, labor politics. And many people began, and this goes back to the issue of Trapeau, began to recognize many of the workers who were in fact constructing Expo itself, uh, uh, began recognizing contradictions of working on these large projects, mega projects of prestige, in which in fact they themselves were shut out from those forms of prosperity which were very much being shown off. So I think in many ways uh, it galvanized certain sectors of the population who saw that the, their interests, their government, did not have their interests in mind that was more, far more concerned with showing off the city to the world. In fact, there even at one point during Expo, uh, the municipal government erected uh, placards on the bridge moving, coming into Montreal so that tourists coming in couldn't, could not see the, the slums below in Saint-Jacques. Right? Uh, you know, so this is, I mean, uh, you know, obviously this is a, you know, an ongoing question when it comes to mega projects in cities. Do we have time for one last question? Does anyone want a last word? One last question? <laughs> yeah. Um, just interested, I guess, in uh, what the legacy of this dynamic time is in the present in Montreal, um, 
I guess with all of the international uh, social movements that are going on with uh, the Middle East, but also just in relation to environmental issues and continued labor relations and this and that. Uh, is there a sense of pride amongst the intellectuals and the youth uh, that this is part of Montreal's history, or is that evident at all in the landscape? That, it's an excellent uh, question. It's one I've thought about a great deal. Um, because one aspect of this history, which I think is most remarkable, for me the most interesting, interesting and um, most surprising perhaps, is that um, many of these movements that I talk about have been forgotten. Um, and I think, per, for me, this particularly has something to do with the way in which uh, very specific national, national teleologies shape our historical memory. So much of the political activity uh, from the 1960s is sort of seen to be various variants of nationalism that was part of the Quiet Revolution, that eventually led to the PQ victory in 1976, etc. And you know, there's some element of truth to that, but it's far more complicated, far more interesting to look at all these various currents that existed. Now, having said that, I do truly believe that these movements politicized uh, everyday life in the province to a very serious degree. And I think even to this day, Montreal has a very politicized uh, public sphere, uh, protests erupting all the time. Certainly, it has a, a very, very strong legacy in the labor movement, uh, which very much looks back to some of the key figures of the period, Michel Chalcon, uh, Pepe, and others as kind of great heroes. Uh, the labor movement. You know, the rate of unionization, of course, in Quebec is still far higher than, than elsewhere uh, in Quebec. So there's, there is a kind of very strong sense of defense of the public sphere. Um, where I, one place where I see this, I, I find it most you know, extremely interesting is, in, in fact, in the Quebec student movement. Um, whereas, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you, know, you see attempts to um, uh, you know, block tuition increases, etc. in Ontario. I've, I've witnessed myself uh, some protests around this just fall completely flat. They can't actually mobilize the, the troops. And it's partly, in my opinion, uh, because they're trying to organize to the kind of rational interests of students and say, well, in fact, you know, if, if more people could go to school, then it would be better, they would higher incomes, etc., etc. Um, in Quebec, the language around the, school, the student movement is always about democracy. It's always about uh, what does it mean to have a, a democracy, to live in a democracy? What does, it, what does education mean? Education is about empowerment. Uh, it's about educating people of all different classes, all different backgrounds, giving them the tools to be able to participate in the society in which they inhabit, to have some kind of, of ability to shape that society in which they, they, take a, they, in which they, they live very concretely. Um, and they very much know, know their history. They very much know uh, about the history of the student movement in the 1960s, as, as well as various other political, politi political struggles of the period. Okay, we'll join you in. Thank you.